Hey everyone, how's it going? It's Matt here with Dory. And today we wanted to do a different style of video to recap the Northern Rimfire Series season finale match that we shot this past weekend in a different format, as I mentioned. So this is going to be more like a podcast style. Obviously there's a video, but uh, it's just going to be us discussing the weekend and talking about our experiences. We did not film this match, as I've mentioned quite a few times in the season. We're filming a lot fewer matches this year because Dory, who is our dedicated camera lady for the channel, is <laughs> focusing more on her shooting performance this year. So the matches that we're taking seriously, which unfortunately is oftentimes some of the more interesting matches that we cover, uh, we've chosen not to cover those for our YouTube videos. So uh, we've shot quite a few matches this year that we haven't covered, and we thought this one was a pretty big match and we had a really good time this weekend shooting it so we wanted to do again sort of just like a recap video and just talk about it so we have a list of items that we wanted to discuss and as usual i'll index my timeline so if you want to you know browse the timeline and see if there's a particular topic that's more interesting to you you can go ahead and just jump forward to that but if not we'll just sort of go down the list and talk we didn't really plan anything out further than just discussing talking points that we thought would be interesting for people to listen to, basically. And uh, that's basically it. So, anything you want to start with? I do have to say, we feel really bad when we don't film. A lot of times we come off a match, have a really fun time. <laughs> and as soon as we're in the car, we're like, oh man, I wish we filmed that. It would have been a great video. <laughs> yeah, that's happened quite a few times this year. I would say, on average, we've probably filmed maybe like 60% of the matches that yeah. we've shot. But there's been quite a few matches, really good matches as well, that we just haven't filmed. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a bummer, but it is what it is. Obviously, we're first and foremost competitors, uh, even though we really like to share the experiences on YouTube. And as you notice, for the Rimfire matches that we have filmed this season, it's mostly just been footage of me. Because again, Dory just sets up the camera, she does her match prep, and it's just really following me more or less this year which again is kind of boring because it's kind of fun to see all sorts of different shooters but it takes a lot of concentration on the day of to have that type of uh, video footage the other reason for this weekend in particular we decided not to film was because it was forecasted to rain really heavily and the weather did not disappoint it did rain both days yeah the forecast wasn't a lie for once uh, <laughs> but even even if it was really nice weather i don't think we would have filmed it because it was a pretty big and important match for both of us being the season finale two-day finale for our canadian club series here i don't think we would have filmed it anyway we had sort of discussed it earlier in the season anyway let's get started uh, before we get into anything we do have a ton of goodies that we got from this weekend and everyone likes goodies so we thought we'd share with you what we managed to uh to score and bring home the first one is actually the trigger so um again super rainy weekend so i pulled all the i tore all the rifles down and i installed a new trigger into this thing that i got from trigger tech i ordered a custom wamfat logo lasered diamond <laughs> for my rifle just uh, for fun so i threw it in the rifle today so that's in there and then wait the colors you don't want to talk about the colors uh, okay i'll put in a i'll put in a picture or a video <laughs> or something but it's a it's like a part spin trigger um it has a gold the rifle's clear obviously there's no bolt in it but it has a gold trigger a gold safety the front face that has my logo engraved is black and then the back face is red so it's it's pretty unique sort of one of a kind so uh, that's the trigger in there. And then I guess we'll just break the news now. Uh, we both won our divisions and got to bring home the golden Trigger Tech Diamonds, which are laser engraved and used for trophies for our club finale series, which is awesome. Our title sponsor for the series is Trigger Tech. If you didn't know, Trigger Tech's a Canadian company. Oh okay. yes, yeah. So these are also, we're getting so sidetracked. This is why we should have planned it. But anyway, <laughs> we, we got these awesome new shirts uh, every year for the finale. Adam Cool, the match director for the NRS, gets some NRS shirts made up. So these are the ones that we just got yesterday or Saturday. Um, and again, so the, the club title sponsor is Trigger Tech. So they make some really cool lasered custom diamond triggers as trophies for our finale match so i was able to to win the match and the season which is really awesome and i was able to take home my first place uh trigger and during i also got a diamond i believe yeah some gold color yep. yeah they're all diamonds <laughs> um 
But I think these trophies are for the season. Yes, they're for and the season. And then the the match trophies are in the mail, so we yeah. haven't seen those yet. Yeah, Adam mentioned um, he did have something for the match winners. Uh, these ones are for the season. So what did you get there? What do you mean? Like uh, what was what did you win? Because. Oh, <laughs> I thought you meant like what product? No, 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 was. sorry. I was like, I what division? I said it. <laughs> what division did you uh, did you win? Um, I won top production for the match and for the series. Yeah. Very happy with that. I think I came in second last year, all the way through the entire year. So finally getting first place it was very rewarding. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit. Uh, it's here on the list, but we'll talk about why Dory is shooting production, even though. If you follow the channel, you know she has a custom uh, open rifle. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about it in a second. But you can put the trophy, I guess, at the front just so people have something to look at. Stare if, at it. If you're actually watching the video. <laughs> yeah. Secondly, from... Actually, let's start with this. Talking about match performances. So every match, obviously, there is a timed tiebreaker stage. But for the Northern Rimfire series, the winner of that particular stage is usually the lucky winner of a product from Insight Arms, another Canadian company that supports the series, so that's awesome. So I was able to win the cert for the Gen 2 uh, Heathen Muzzle Brake with Integral Tuner. So this cert, you have to redeem for the uh, the tuner, but that's pretty awesome. So we'll talk about the time stage, because that's actually a very important um, important stage this uh, this match of you know how everything went down. And then from the prize table, you want to show them... So, the, I actually didn't go for the prize table. Right, I guess it was technically my pull from the prize table because it was... Um, I actually you were really, called earlier. Yeah. So, I, I like how Adam does this, just talking about prize tables. Um, Adam doesn't do a prize table for every match. He accumulates and amasses a very impressive <laughs> prize table just for this finale match. The way he runs the prize table is he actually, well, he does it differently every year, but this year what he did, which I really like, is he did three random draws to go first, completely random, doesn't matter where you finish, and then it's the top three, which, again, I think it's really good because usually the top performers at a match are at the top of their game, which usually means they're sponsored and they might not need all the high ticket items on the prize table. So that allows three random shooters to go, to, first. To go first and get those, you know, really sought after prizes, whatever you want to call them. And then the three, the top three run it and then it's random after that, I believe. Is that? So it alternates like three random, three oh, next I in see. line okay. of the match standings. Yes, so but it's on. good. It mixes, it basically mixes it enough where if you place high, you have a really good chance of walking earlier, but you still give a lot of opportunity for anyone in the leaderboards to walk early. Yes. So anyway, and so Matt went in, went up so to I was the fourth. line fourth. Yeah, yeah, I was fourth after the three rounds. So there's since still I won. a lot of good prices to be won, yeah. and we've talked about this. Um, Matt has a Kestrel, and he uses it for all his matches. I, on the other hand, I don't know if mine is called a Kestrel. So she has a Kestrel weather meter, but it's not a ballistics uh, Kestrel unit. And she's been using Strelock, actually. We wanted to make sure that Dory was fully independent, so she has all her own gear, and she does her own dope with Strelock, which is actually a f really powerful software that works well, but it's just not as fine-tuned as a Kestrel with applied ballistics. Like, having a dedicated unit is something that would be really good for, for Dory, and we don't always shoot together at every match. So, um, looking at the prize table, there was a single 5700 Elite on it, and uh, I like to pull things off prize tables that we can definitely use. So I said, if that's still on there after the three people walk, I'll, uh, I'll grab it for, for Dory. So that's what I did. So I got a prize too, even though I didn't get called. <laughs> <laughs> By the time yeah. they got to my standing, they were like, it's a free-for-all. So yeah. I was like, I'm not going to yeah. fight some guys that are two times bigger than I am. It's not that chaotic. Adam, Adam is good at keeping things uh, yeah. in order, so yeah. it was just a long lineup. But anyway, I'm really happy Dora is able to get the 5700 Elite because it's uh, it's going to be really good for her. I think that's sort of like the next step in her shooting game. And then um, I also managed to pull this uh, plate from Vangel, I hope I'm saying that right, Vangel Designs, but it's really nice. It's a billet aluminum tack table with a lot of M-lock and uh, quarter 20 uh, sockets everywhere so I'm gonna test this out I'll probably do a little uh, quick review on this later down the road so this is really cool and I'm excited to test that out all right so that's all the goodies we pulled 
Okay, so let's uh, finally cover the weekend, how it happened, everything. So the general vibe was unfortunately a bit of a downer only because of the forecast. Everyone is so excited to shoot this match, but the forecast was miserable. Uh, this is the first match after the summer that has been truly cold. Because through the summer you're shooting, you know, some rainy matches, but they're not bone chilling. This one was, I think, 7 to 8 degrees Celsius all weekend and raining. Which it, it's dropped down to 6. Or yeah, rather, the, it started at Yeah, six. in the mornings it was like 5, 6, and then it only got up to a high of, of eight. 8. So it was cold. <laughs> I don't know if that is in Fahrenheit. I'll, I'll subtitle it or something. But it was cold, and you mix rain and wind into that. It's bone chilling. So the whole weekend was like that. Um, we only got a sunny break at the very end. I believe the last two stages we shot on Sunday were in the sun everything else was in cold windy rain I, I think some shooters also said that the entire year they've shot only rainy matches like this this year has been quite rainy um this finale was no exception um for nrs series in particular um i found that every match we shot us was super windy yeah not the not the greatest weather so the season standings coming into this finale match was actually kind of interesting because usually the NRS season has like six matches leading up to the Magneto 1 finale, but this season was a bit condensed with only four. And because of how we planned our match schedule this season, we knew we could only make three, which means I don't have as many opportunities to try to win matches to get my full 300 points going into the club standings for the finale. But I actually ended up being first place going into the finale out of luck i think the performances i had at the nrs matches were just really good of the three that i made so i was like a seven or eight point lead above second place which was steve my uh, my go big tactical teammate so last year we went into the finale both th with 300 points so it was a really tight race but this year i had a bit of a gap which could have easily be deleted over 20 stages seven points is not much at all um, but i had a bit of an advantage for sure and then there was like a huge fight between like steve and second all the way down to like seventh or eighth were all within another like seven or eight points so it was really tight for them and then a, a little bit of a gap to me so season standings were tight and dory was top production by a fairly big margin. So she was uh, just trying to keep it locked in for the for the match, basically. Yeah, I would say going into this match, even though I was top production, I was still quite nervous. Um, like I explained before, the weather has been brutal for all of the NRS matches. And so all the points I got, I had to try really hard to get. So I wasn't sure I can keep in focus for the finale the same way. Um, but we'll talk about how those stages went. Uh, yeah, we will give some uh, tips of cold and wet weather shooting afterwards, as well as cover a few stages. So Dory and I each chose two or three stages we want to cover mm -hmm. or just talk about afterwards. But also we should probably discuss why you were shooting production division, because everyone knows you have that fancy Desert Precision <laughs> Gunworks custom build. So she's been shooting open in a few matches, but this one was production. For the open rifle, the plan originally was to only start shooting that next year, but because of Wisconsin Championship, we realized that my production rifle didn't cut it off. What's their category called? Uh, it's fa uh, not fa factory, it's a uh, base. Yeah, so I didn't fit into the base category and I didn't want to hold myself back if I wasn't going to be shooting base, so we decided to get myself an open rifle. Um, but I already started NRS with production and I just wanted to continue the entire series with production just to see where I can end off. Um, since I was always second last year, I want to see if I can do a little better. Yeah, essentially she started NRS in production so we just wanted to finish the season in it. And she will also be going into regionals and nationals for PRS in production. And then next year she'll switch fully to open. So. I got a few questions asking why Dory was shooting production, and that's the reason why. Also, I wanted to mention that this was the first Magneto One finale match with U.S. shooters. So Stefan and Sabrina Gamond came up from the U.S., which was really awesome. We've had a few U.S. shooters shoot our other matches during the season, but this was the first time U.S. shooters came up for the finale. So that was actually really cool. It makes us very makes us Canadians very excited when the U.S. come. <laughs> yeah, but we apologize for the Canadian tree that fell on their car in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, let's go on to 
some cold and wet weather shooting tips because this match, as we mentioned, so it's a 20 stage match over two days, 10 stages on the first day, 10 stages on the second day. And because both of the days were cold and rainy, you really had to manage your shooting performance in that terrible weather. So honestly, I think a lot of shooters struggled with that. I got a lot of questions from other shooters at the match of how I was dealing with it. And that can be a huge factor in where you place overall. If you can deal with the cold and the, the rain better than other shooters, that's a huge advantage. So if you know how to do that and you can shoot in terrible conditions, you actually favor terrible condition matches because it gives you an advantage. So anyway, we, we wrote up a few tips here that we thought would be interesting and hopefully helpful. So First and foremost, check the weather before you go. We've seen some shooters come to matches that aren't completely dressed for the occasion. Yeah. And that kills you. Like, they cannot complete the course of fire at all. So it seems like an obvious thing to do, but definitely check the weather. Bring the adequate clothing for that. Yeah, and I will say, like, looking at the forecast leading up to this match, we almost couldn't believe it was so cold because all our matches had been, like, summer temperatures. So we're like, man, like, is it really going to be less than 10 degrees? So yeah. a lot of people weren't packing the cold weather items that you needed we actually ended up both wearing down layers which usually is a winter thing but because of the rain the rain it really adds a huge factor for the coldness you feel because nine degrees or eight degrees normally is not bad eight degrees in the rain is something totally different so i had a down like base layer that I usually wear under my winter jacket in the winter, and Dory had a down vest with a sweater underneath it, so it was cold. And two shirts. <laughs> yeah, and, and two shirts underneath that, so definitely dress for the uh, temperature, but in the rain, obviously, keep, keeping dry is just as crucial because it doesn't matter how many layers you have on. If you get wet, it's game over. Your, your bo uh, core body temperature is gonna drop really quickly and keeping dry is just as important so my rain pants because we've used it so darn much this season <laughs> had a rip in them so when we when we arrived on location friday night sport check was still open i think it was sport check and uh, i ran in and bought a new pair of rain pants because i knew they were going to come in handy i'm really glad i did because they were i wore them the entire match the other thing about uh, rain pants is you want them to connect to your shoe. I know a lot of people like to use shoes that don't have that... Ankle support. Yeah, ankle support. And all the water just funnels from your pants to your socks. <laughs> yeah. And that's very unfortunate. And if you're using, if you're using high socks, it, the, the water goes both ways up and into your <laughs> shoes. So it's just like you got to keep that seam. I know tight. rain boots are not as warm, but I would stick to them because they keep me dry. Yeah, Dory prefers rain boots because uh, they're like semi-high rain boots in terms of how high the ankle goes. So she still has good ankle uh, flexibility and then she'll just double up socks if it's a little bit cooler. Yeah. I prefer hiking boots so i have a gore-tex actually they're not gore-tex they're keen and keen doesn't use gore-tex they use their own membrane i don't know why i know that but anyway <laughs> so i have waterproof hiking boots and i prefer to use those even in really wet conditions because i find them more comfortable than rain boots uh, rain boots are just a little bit clunky for me so they do a really good job my hikers do a really good, good job of keeping out the moisture but when they get really saturated they will become a little bit damp inside but they're easy to dry overnight so mm -hmm. i prefer my hiking boots and i wear them all year round it doesn't matter what the temperature is they're what i use or, except for the winter i'm talking about like normal match season spring to fall i use my hiking boots for everything in the rain um top layers on you know torso just rain jackets a good quality rain jacket is important the thing about gloves, so some guys like gloves. We prefer no gloves in the rain because, again, when they get soaked, they don't really stay warm. I find it because they separate your fingers, too. They chill it when they're wet. Right. Yeah, I know, I know some guys like it. Do what works for you. But I will say this match, the finger warmth was a huge factor because our hands got so cold. Between... Uh, stages. I had my my jacket unzipped, and I had like my my hands and my armpits trying to warm up. They were freezing. I actually had to start um, shooting matches or shooting some stages differently than I normally would because I couldn't feel my fingers. For example, dialing 
like it hurt. Like any, if I had to grasp anything hard with knurling, it actually hurt my fingertips because they were so cold, and I didn't have the fine motor skills to actually dial quickly <laughs> and accurately. So I decided halfway through uh, day one, I, I had to use holdovers because I just couldn't dial. So you got to sort of change your plan depending on what's happening. And when I was prioritized, so if I'm spotting or using the tablet, ROing with the um, the shot timer, I would try and use my left hand for everything because I didn't want to sacrifice my trigger fingers. So I would have this in my in my pocket or whatever, trying to keep my, my trigger hand warm. <laughs> and I would sacrifice my left hand to try and do everything else. Cause the, you know, anything that's exposed is, is getting wet. And with the wind too, it was, it was wicking off the moisture and cooling down anything it touched. And then it would just get wet again for more rain. So it was, it was really hard to stay warm, but we were trying our best. And on day two, I brought an umbrella with me, which helped a lot because as soon as I was done shooting, I would stand under my umbrella and it would it helped keep my hands warm specifically, which I think was a big help. The other good use for umbrella is to write your dope, Ashley. Because we've yeah. been to matches where it's a heavy downpour and the ink would spread while you're writing and the paper gets so soaked that it's like disintegrating in your hands. Yeah. So if you write your dope under an umbrella, you make sure that it's still legible when you need to use it. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, same with loading ammo. Loading ammo with wet hands like you're getting water in your mags and stuff so it's better to do it as sheltered as possible uh something else you might not think about is snacks that are cold resistant which sounds so weird but what that means is some snacks are really bad in the cold and shooting so many matches over the years i've come to understand what snacks don't work in the cold so anything that turns into a rock that will <laughs> break your teeth when they're cold just leave them at home if it's under 10 degrees celsius uh, like cliff bars get really, really hard. And I really like snacks that are like made for kids. So I used to take <laughs> Rice Krispies with me, but Rice Krispies, when they're cold, it's like chewing gravel. <laughs> it, it's so hard on your teeth. So anyway, if you do bring one of those snacks, you can put it in one of your like inside pockets to warm it up before you eat it. Or you can just try and <laughs> bring better snacks. So like soft cookies are okay. Some granola bars are okay in the cold um, but more like chewy foods like we, we bring a lot of uh, pouches of applesauce that i really like to snack on throughout the day because it's a quick way you don't even have to chew it you're more just drinking the applesauce out of the pouch and it's a good way to get some some sugar and nutrients into you anything to add i'm surprised you didn't say bear paws that's Matt's number well, one snack. I don't know if bear paws are universally known. I think they might be like an Ontario thing. I don't even know if they have them in the States. It's but a very soft cookie. It's a very <laughs> soft cookie, almost like, I don't want to say cake because it's not fluffy. It's, it's dense yeah. like a cookie, but soft. And in the cold, I find they don't get hard. They just get more crummy. Yeah. Which is good because you can still bite them. So I always eat bear paws. And everyone who shoots with me knows I survive on bear paws and apple juice. Or uh, pardon it, me, applesauce. Leave us in match. a comment if we're going to see you in a match and you want to try one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably have one. Yeah, that's right. I always eat bear paws and applesauce throughout my match days. Everyone knows that. Uh, and water intake. When it's cold, it's really easy to ignore your water intake or liquid intake in general because you feel like you don't need to. You're not losing as much liquid as if it was hot, which is good in one sense, but because you don't feel like you're not losing liquid, a lot of people just don't drink. I noticed a lot of people weren't drinking and it can hit you hard all of a sudden towards the end of the day. So even if you're not thirsty, take a few sips of water between each stage and you'll probably feel a lot better. I kept reminding Dory because Dory isn't really good at... <laughs> Door is always dehydrated. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> after every other stage, I'd be like, hey, I'll make sure you drink a little bit of water and uh, stay on top of the water intake, even if it's cold. It's, uh, it's important. And next one is rain covers. I mean, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but specifically for your rifle, because with the amount of rain coming down, your action just gets completely soaked. Now, it's not going to stay dry regardless of what you do because you're shooting in the rain anyway, but it's between stages when it's just sitting there. You don't want rain just coming down and getting into your trigger group and pooling you know, on your bolt and stuff. So try and keep that as covered as possible. Well, the other reason you don't want your bolt to get wet is if you add oil to your bolt to make sure it runs smoothly, the rain will wash it out. And you don't want to be applying oil right before every single stage. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, a lot of lubrication will get washed off in the rain. My <laughs> my voodoo bolt 
got really bad on I don't know if you noticed the first stage on day two yeah I was like <laughs> slamming my bow forward and like using a close fist to like push it down and then I take my shot it, and then uh, we like to use a really like gummy lubricant because it, it keeps its uh, I don't know, position or whatever better in the wet as well so we use Lucas oil I think it's called Lucas Extreme Gun Oil or whatever, but it's like a really snotty consistency mm. of uh, lubricant, but it's good for wet weather because it doesn't just get flushed out of the system like a... Too quickly. Uh, yeah, exactly. And your bag fill, if you haven't already, try crushed glass sandblasting media. That's what we use. It doesn't absorb water and it stays malleable even in the wet condition. Well, relatively. It does get a little more stiff. But, it's, but that's that's the canvas. That's not the glass medium. Oh, I see. Yeah, so the wax canvas will get stiff even if you oil it or wax it the night before. But the media inside, if you change to the glass, the crushed glass, will still stay uh, malleable, which is good. Okay, let's uh, go... Before we go into some stages that we chose to well, before cover... before you do that... Mm -hmm. Make sure you watch our tips for a rainy matches video. <laughs> yeah, we had another match earlier on in the season, and instead of covering any match footage, we just decided to film some rainy day tips for Pure S. Yeah. Okay, so before we go into the stages, let's just do a quick rifle breakdown of what we were shooting. So this is my rifle that I was shooting. It's the same rifle that won the NRS match, finale match, and season last year. So it doesn't really need an introduction if you follow the channel, but it's obviously my Desert Precision Gunworks Custom Voodoo Shillin Barrel. It's uh, the Shillin Select Match 16 tw uh, six, 1 and 16 inch twist, 4 groove ratchet rifling, Razor Gen 3. I switched out to a Grey Ops mount this year, which I absolutely love, and I also switched the chassis from the Care GC4. I'm shooting the ACC Elite this year. So that's me with the Trigger Tech Diamond, obviously. And the Dory was shooting a production rifle, which was a CZ 457 in, in Woodstock. It's the well, it's a factory rifle, so nothing's been changed. It's the Pro Varmint model of the 457. Uh, the only thing she has added uh, legally for the production division is her cheek riser kit from Victor Company. It's just an add-on. You just bolt it on to the uh, the stock for your cheek height, but everything else is factory on that thing. And a one fat sticker. And a sticker. <laughs> oh, and she shoot, her scope is a Bushnell Match Pro ED. She's shooting, actually, interesting note on ammo. So this match, Dory actually switched ammo. Which, for the first time. Yeah, it was like her first match shooting this new ammo, which was the semi-auto bench rest from Ely. It actually shoots pretty well. And the reason why we switched is because her long range match, her SK long range match that she's been using for the whole season, which historically has shot really well for me. So I still think very highly of the ammo, but we were having some weird elevation issues with Dory and we're not sure if it's because of the temperature sensitivity of the ammo. It was hard to track because we don't have many days dedicated to just testing ammo, especially at different temperatures. So we can only see what happens to us at matches. Um, so we switched to the Ely for this match and it worked out pretty well, I would say. Yeah, it was good. I, I think I need more matches to see if I actually like it, but I think so I think far, going so forward, good. especially since the temperatures are dropping, we'll use Ely because this time of year, oftentimes the morning will be really, really cold and then it'll go up to like 25 Celsius in the afternoon. So there's a huge temperature swing. And if you're not tracking your temperature uh, stability of your ammo properly, it can come to bite you. So anyway, I was shooting Ely 10X, which I've been shooting for a couple months now. And you like it. I love it. That stuff is awesome. <laughs> okay. So those are the rifles we were shooting. We each picked a few stages. So we have five stages in total that we wanted to cover. Again, we don't have a footage for anything because we weren't filming, but we'll just talk about it. And I'll put like the uh, stage description on the screen. So the first stage is stage four. The fire hose, which a lot of people... A lot of people were not excited about, but this but is... But let me tell you why. Let me describe the prop first. So the, the prop is, you can imagine just a giant sawhorse. Everyone knows what a sawhorse is, you know, two legs and a cross beam. But it, that cross beam is probably about four feet high. So it's, it's a good 
height for a standing shooting position with yes. a bag on the crossbar basically. So, and then with two legs, however, on that crossbar, there's three loops that are like nail gunned to the bottom of the crossbar. And those loops are fire hose sections. So the hoses obviously are very flexible and the loops move a lot. So we had- In all directions. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's literally a loop of fabric. Yeah. So this stage has three positions on the crossbar and then of the, th of the three loops, you chose one loop to shoot from in your last position. Actually, it specifies that it has to be the middle loop. Oh, okay. Well, good thing I shot from the middle loop because I didn't read that part. All right, so you want to read the stage description? Okay. Right? On the engage command, the shooter will engage the targets near to far with one shot from the three positions above the fire hose loops and the middle loop. Okay, so again, one, two, three on the crossbar and then middle loop. So what are the targets? So there's a four inch diamond at 131 yards. 6 inch diamond at 144 yards and a third ipsic 153 yards. It's funny because I when I read the stage description description, I was like, "Oh, those are pretty generous targets." But when you're shooting the stage, they don't feel generous. And the reason why we uh, chose this to talk about another interesting fact is Dory and I were the only two <laughs> shooters out of 90 shooters at this match to clean that stage, which is again pretty funny. So, I will add I've shot this prop three times. I've never missed a shot on this prop before. What? I've timed out once. Oh, I but see. But I okay. have not missed a shot on it that I've taken. So now what Dory mentioned before, when people <laughs> see the fire hose prop in the course of fire, everyone has like a collective like, oh, like here's that prop again because everyone hates shooting from those loops. And historically, Adam has made us shoot usually from all three loops, but this time we're only shooting from one loop in the last position. It still sucked, but yeah. what, how I approached it, and I think you did the same thing. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but we just went normal barricade bag over across the top three positions. And then on the loop, we did tripod rear support because just from knowing this prop from the past, shooting those loops at small targets, it's almost, it's not impossible, but it's almost impossible to get stable enough to make good shots, especially if you don't practice off like hanging barricades, which I don't. It's just a lot easier if you let everything settle with rear tripod support and then pull the shot off. But it's it's time consuming, so that's why it's I would tough. have to say the only way to not miss on the fire hose is to use tripod on the back. Uh, it's the it's the only way that you keep the swing from going too far off target. Um, but I would also say it's my favorite prop to use tripod on because it's very forgiving. The fact that you can swing the front of the rifle a little bit, like let's say you put the tripod in the wrong position slightly, you can just push your rifle a little bit just to be on. That sounds really bad. That To me, that just sounds like really bad. It's weird for me every NPA. time. <laughs> I'm very bad at using the tripod and that one, <laughs> that prop has always worked for me. We were the only two to clean it and honestly, I was actually quite surprised because we cleaned it back to back. Dory was shooting in front of me almost all, all match. It yeah. was Doria than me, like right back to back. So she cleaned it and then I cleaned it and then everyone else was struggling. But I think a lot of people were taking their time across the top and even some people were even dialing for all the, all the targets. And then they got to the loop and then they felt rushed. And because the loop was the last position and, and the, the most unstable and the most unstable, I, I bet you most people dropped shots when they were shooting from the loop. And I remember, I distinctly remember, I pulled the shot, my last shot, within a second of the timer going off. Because I pulled it, the timer went off, and everyone's like, oh, wow, like buzzer beater. <laughs> so it was, it was pretty tight, but I managed to, uh, to clean it as well. So for me, that was a very strong um, start of the match for me. We, we shot all the stages in order, 1 to 20, and this was our fourth stage, and yeah. I, was, I was feeling good. <laughs> yeah. I think we should also mention for this match, our squad was pure squatted for the top 10 in the season. So the top 10 shooters for the standings were squatted together with top production. So we shot, again, as Dory mentioned, stage one all the way to 20, whereas other squads started you know, somewhere in the middle. Next uh, stage we wanted to highlight was stage 18. So this was towards the end of day two. Why don't we do the Rhino first? Because that's still day one. Sure. Okay. So stage two, the second stage we shot was the Rhino. It's called the Rhino because it is a, I believe it's a barricade for construction use. 
Well, there's a Rhino logo on it, which makes me think the product or the brand is called Rhino. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a Rhino barricade. I think it's for like when they have to divide streets and stuff. It's like a big orange thing. It's one section of a modular system. So there's like a little nub on each side, then a long sort of top bar. Yeah, it's flat. But in the middle, there's three very small ports. I would say these ports are no bigger than probably six inches wide and like at most 10 inches tall. So they have these three little porch ports in the middle of this barricade. And we had to shoot from the top, the nub on the side, and then each of the ports. I think we were just double tapping one target, right? Um, two shots, yes. So the reason why I wanted to talk about this stage is because shooting through tiny little ports like that when your field of view through the port is significantly cut, what I find is a lot of people will get the rifle through the port. Actually, the whole rifle doesn't even fit because of this, this part of your rifle on a bag doesn't fit into the port. So you can only put the, the, forehand. the front of your, your yeah, the forehand through the port. And then you're not as stable that way either. But I see a lot of people, they'll put their rifle into the port, they'll get all set up, and, but they haven't found the target. So you can't see where the target is. So they just start like, panning around with their you know with their scope trying to find the target and they kill so much time so a lot of people they don't realize how tricky that's going to be and then they end up timing out because each port they're trying to find the target so my tip is because the construction barricade isn't that high it's probably like three feet at most so i can just kneel at the on the top uh part of the barricade but on the ports it's like an awkward sitting kneeling crouched height so what I do is, as I'm putting the rifle into the port, I'm popping up my head above the entire barricade to locate the target, and I'll point my rifle right at it, because oftentimes, Adam purposely will like blade the rhino just slightly, so, so, nice. it, so it just messes you up. So I'll make sure my rifle's pointed right at you know the, the target, then I'll get settled in on the port, and then I usually just have to come up and down a little bit to find it. So that's how I do that. And what I, I did was, before I put my rifle in the port, I actually lean a little bit back. I see the target through the port oh, and I just way. aim it and put yeah. it in. Yeah, but that's basically why I wanted to highlight this stage because a lot of people also hate this barricade because those ports are such an awkward like milk crate height above the ground and it makes target acquisition really hard. He's also done it before where you have like multiple targets to engage through the port at like different angles in the field and then it just becomes a little bit of a, uh, a challenge. Do you remember how you how well you did on that stage? Mm. Oh, that's your score. Yeah, so you got. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I cleaned it. Yeah, I got. I dropped a two because I brought a pump pillow for the ports. Oh yes. Um, but the pump pillow is too small; didn't touch the ground, so it's floating. I should have adjusted my feet, but I always panic under time pressure, and I didn't know how to f fix it, so I just kept wobbling with it. Yeah, that's not ideal. I, Adora's trying to work on making sure that she doesn't, she doesn't settle for a bad shot, which she does too often right now. She'll get in a bad position, but she's too, too scared to fix. Too scared to take the time to fix it, so she'll just pull bad shots, which is not ideal at all. So I used the same pump pill and same technique as she did, but I made sure that I was solid on the rear support because keep in mind you're not on your balance point in the ports you're you're only the front of your rifles through it so you have a lot of rear weight to manage so you have to make sure you have good rear support through that porthole in order to take the shot properly all right stage uh five actually so, okay we'll do five and 16 together i chose both these stages because they're both 10 position, 10 round stages. So each position you take one shot at a single target. So they're fast paced stages. And I wanted to talk about moving in and out of more ports <laughs> because the two, well, I won't describe them in great detail, but basically they were both a different style of cattle gate with different styles of ports you had to move. Mm -hmm. And each had 10 unique positions. You never reused a position. So they're large cattle gates. I will say, Target acquisition is a huge one again. Just making sure that you know exactly where your target is before you get in position is crucial. So right when you get on your, to your rifle, it's basically pointed dead on target. You just have to get stable, apply your wind call, pull the shot, and then move. 
Um, another thing that I see a lot of people doing is struggling because if you just have 10 positions across a bar, it's pretty easy. You just, you know, move your whole setup each time. But when you have to go in and out of a port with, you know, a top section of that port, that's when it becomes really difficult for some shooters, especially when you have really long barrels like this, because to pull out the entire rifle and then go back into another port is what people struggle with. So practice it. <laughs> it's, uh, there's different techniques to do it. I have a ton of match footage on my channel now. You can see the different techniques that I use going in and out of ports. Sometimes I'll suitcase carry using my scope. I know some people like to avoid that. I don't really care. Um, but I'll also use a another method where I will drag the forend of my rifle along the bag. And once the bag gets to the end of the forend, I'll pick up the entire system and then go into the next port like this, if that makes sense. If you're strong enough. Yeah, you do have to have the strength, but I'm not particularly strong and I can do it with a 24. Actually, yeah, I do even my center fire, which is like a 25, 26 pound rifle. I'm just saying that because with my open rifle, I struggled, I practiced I with it and I still can't, I can't pick it up yeah. with. Yeah. It's just it's just something to practice and obviously getting stable quickly is another important thing to be able to do. However, do not sacrifice your fundamentals and proper shot, you know, uh, fundamentals in each position because if you're just rushing each position, it's better if you actually slow down and just take the time in each position to get steady because if you're just rushing your shots, you're probably going to do worse than just slowing down and then let your practice build speed naturally that's what i say your your efficiency on a stage should come from your movement but when you're in position getting stable don't sacrifice your fundamentals uh but you you can work to get stable quicker but don't sacrifice that during the match would you agree with that yeah 100 percent. my my two stages were very drastic in comparison actually yeah. um i have a bit of a, a story um so for stage five I got half the points. I was very disappointed. Actually, it was the first stage that I um, did bad on, and I was just so sad about it. Um, but basically what happened was, we've mentioned in the beginning of this video, is the weather is actually quite inconsistent in terms of wind. It was switching in magnitude a lot. And when you're so focused, especially for a slow shooter, to go through 10 different ports, you're not really taking the time to look at what the weather's doing. And so I was on the top rungs, I was able to, I knew what the wind was, so I was able to hit all my targets. But, but when I went switched. to the bottom, the wind switched and I could not find it. And I didn't give myself time to process what the wind was doing. I just kept going. And missing. <laughs> and just missed all, well, I missed four and then timed out on the fifth. So that's why I got 50. Uh, 50%. But then that night, uh, after day one, I could not sleep and all I could think of was, why is it that I did so well in the morning, but I did so average or like, you know, 50% of my stage points um, in the afternoon. And I realized it's because in the morning, the wind was so consistent that when I'm on binos, I know what I'm going into for my wind hold and I was able to keep that wind hold for entire stage. But once it hit the afternoon and the wind was switching, switching yeah, that's a good point. I was no longer assessing On during the stage, the stage yeah. uh, what the wind was doing. Actually, so, now that you mentioned that, I remember as well, on the, the second 10 position stage on day two, I did drop one because of a wind switch. But as soon as I missed that target, I stopped and I made sure I knew what happened, like which side did I drop it off on. And I actually remember, now that you say that, it was a right to left almost all day. And then when I dropped that shot, it was off the right side, which means the wind died. And I remember seeing the rain, because it was raining all day. I remember seeing the rain behind the target in my scope. It went from being on like basically a 45, the rain just slowly shifted to a vertical. Mm -hmm. So when I missed the shot, I took a look at the rain and it was straight up and down. So then I got into the next position. I just held dead center for the rest of the stage. Yeah, so to, to finish my story on day two, I made it a mission that while I'm shooting, I would look at the rain as my wind flag to know if I need to increase my wind hold or decrease it. And by the time we got to stage 16, large gate, which is the exact same, you know, 
sequence that you have to do from day one. I actually managed to not time out for one thing. I think you got an eight. And mm. I got eight. I only and, missed two. <laughs> but uh, it was actually impressive because the wind switched like at three? least twice. Yeah, like two or three times during her stage. Yeah, it and was, I saw it. It was going right and then it died and then went left and then back right. I think that's what happened during your stage. It was crazy, and she and caught it. I would come off the stage, and he'd be like, "What's the wind?" And it was, I did not know how to answer. Yeah, she was like, it was like everything. Yeah, she's like everything. I was like, "All right," <laughs> but it was, it was actually really impressive that you caught that. It's nice to learn during a match. Yeah. <laughs> stage eighteen is the next one that you chose. Three large spools. So this was three spools placed two on the bottom and one on the top. And you shot left spool, top spool, and then right spool. There was two arrays of two targets each, so two and two. Two near and two far. The two near targets were at 125 yards, and the two far targets were at 211. Yeah. Each of the three positions, you just went near, near, far, far, move, repeat, move, repeat. Strangely, the two near ones were very small, um, and then the two far ones were very large <laughs> yeah they were quite generous but so the the difficult targets were actually the closer ones at 125 yes. because one was a uh one was a pig silhouette which was a really small pig silhouette and then a gopher which is long and skinny so most people would start because it didn't specify so most people would start on the pig Since to get wider yeah because again wind was tricky so you try and get your wind call on the pig and then apply that wind call on the gopher yeah I wanted to talk about this one because, like I said, I made it a mission to observe the environment while I was shooting, and this was one where I did, I think I, I did really well on, but the wind still got me. It was so frustrating, I couldn't stop thinking about it. Yeah. So I only dropped two, and those two drops were all on the gopher, so the skinny little stick. <laughs> so what happened was I would shoot the pig, find the wind call, and then try to hit the gopher and the wind would switch a little bit enough that it pushed me off so it was it pushed me off the target then i went to shoot the far ones came back to shoot the pig and by the time i got back to the gopher <laughs> i was like i need to hold more because i last time it pushed me off so i held more and the wind died and so it, the bullet went the opposite direction it was it was a really s switchy wind um so what you had to do was you had to take the wind call from the last target, but then quickly feel the wind to see if it changed and then yeah. apply like a slight correction on your, you know, subsequent tar but target what, engagements. What I shouldn't have done was take a mental note from the last time I shot the gopher because I, by the time I come back to it, I have shot three other targets and moved. So yeah. it's a, a long time. Yeah. It's a long time. So I should have really checked the pig to see where I hit on that plate and then make a yes. decision from there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, lessons learned. I think I cleaned that stage. Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, last stage I wanted to talk about. This is where it gets juicy. As I mentioned, Steve, Borso, and I, we're, we're great friends and we're teammates as well on Gobic Tactical. But uh, we we're, you know have friendly competition between us, a bit of friendly rivalry, if you will. So, after the two days and 19 stages in, we have one stage left. And we were tied in points. I didn't know this, but Steve apparently, you know, after day one, they posted scores. So we knew he was one point behind me. So we knew we were close. And then he, I think he was tracking my scores on day two. So he told me after stage 19, he was like, Matt, we're tied. So it comes down to this stage. <laughs> and this stage was, for most people, a meat grinder. It was a generally low scoring stage. And it was the time stage. Keep in mind, I won it, so you kind of know what happens. But <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, a long-range troop line, so there was five targets from 200 out to 381 yards. Yes. And you just triple-tapped the targets going out. So it's a 15-round stage, five targets, triple-tap them going out. I have to say, a lot of people timed out on this one. A lot of people timed out on this one, and because we were the last squad to shoot it, as squads were rotating back, from stage 20 as they were coming back we heard so many horror stories of stage 20 and people were just shaking their heads we've you know, been told the defeated. average is a five out of 15. well yeah on day one when people were coming <laughs> back around they were saying how they got like thrown into the meat ground there on, on stage 20. so we had a, a little bit of anxiety going into the stage steve uh 
was the first one to shoot. So that's a disadvantage, no matter how you cut it. First, first one to shoot the long range stage because you don't have the opportunity to see other people and talk about Winkle. Because our squad was great. Every every single stage, someone would come off the line and you would tell each other what you're holding for wind. It's sort of like, in a sense, a team sport because we all, we all want to see each other perform as best as possible. But a long range stage, the last stage, and you know you're you know, first or second place hinges on this stage performance. It's a big stressor. Uh, and then we realized from the squad that just shot it, that when they rotated off of it, when we were coming onto the stage, they let us know that two of the target indicators had failed because they shot them off <laughs> of the last two targets, which is a big disadvantage because instead of waiting to see the target indicator to know if you hit the target, you have to now wait for the audible feedback because you can't really see your impacts at that distance which it, takes longer and yeah, with much when, longer and with the time crunch being so tight we were really worried about we're all going to time out if we don't have indicators on that's right because you have to think if you seeing an indicator flash at 300 yards or 380 yards versus waiting for the sound to travel back to you it might be two seconds but you multiply that over three whatever, shots like each. more yeah three shots each target you're at a huge time disadvantage so steve went out on the four by four with uh, the match director to fix the indicators <laughs> but as he was fixing them he realized wait now i'm giving myself an advantage because i'm down range feeling what the wind is doing so he after they hung up the indicators again he came back and he told the squad what the wind was doing out there so it was a level playing field but he was like guys the wind out there is not as bad because there's like these weird dips and valleys and tree lines and stuff so he's like the wind past the 250 yard mark isn't as bad as you think so he went to shoot it and uh he couldn't connect with the last target and he missed one somewhere else in the middle so he dropped four so he still got 11 yeah he got 11 of 15 which was actually one of the higher scores no one had cleaned it and like if you got it above a 10 it was really good so that put a lot of pressure on me because i know you know my my win or not win comes down to that and i was much later down in the squad after steve so my anxiety is building up and i'm like oh man here it goes <laughs> you know so that it's my turn to shoot and uh, well as you know i i was the only one to clean it but i also cleaned it in 68 seconds which was pretty darn fast the fastest <laughs> yeah, it was the fastest and the only clean, which again, but the only reason why I was able to do that is because I made a first one impact on each target. So as soon as I saw the first one impact, I would just send two more because I didn't, I didn't want the, the wind to switch. So that's how I approached that stage. So I shot it pretty fast and I didn't have to do a mag change because I, ha I actually have a 15 round mag as well for this rifle, which I don't generally use. I only use it for high round count stages and uh, it worked out. But that was, it was just kind of funny how everything boiled down to this last stage and we were all sort of hyping it up after hearing how devastating it was to other squads and stuff. Dory actually did uh, quite well on it too. You got a... I was going to say, you sure you didn't clean it because I told you the wind call? Yeah. Because I shot right before it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and what did you get? Um, I got 12 out of 15. I'm super proud of it. Um, it was very tricky because... Uh, People who were shooting before me were telling me that they held, I think, a 0.5 for the first target and a 1.5 for the far. Which was which was crazy, considering we were holding a 1.5 for targets within, like, 150 throughout the match. Keep in so mind, windy. this is the first stage, or the second stage, that was sunny, so the wind was starting to die. That's true. Yeah, the rain had passed and the sun was coming out at this point. What? Sorry, not to, but to backtrack again, it's funny because at that time we actually wanted the rain because the rain was helping us read wind throughout the match. Because again, you could see the angle of the, the rain relative to you in the scope. But then when the rain stopped as we were approaching this long range stage, we were actually bummed because we were like, well, there goes our wind flag. Yeah. Actually, yeah. You're, you brought a good point. Like, that was one of the things that really scared me about this match. One, because everyone was telling us they were doing so bad on it. And then now my wind flag is gone. <laughs> yeah. That I've been paying attention to the entire day. And so I had no help. Um, and then, like I said, people were telling me what the wind calls was. But turns out, did not apply to me. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so I went up and I hit the first couple of targets. Somewhere in the middle, I dropped. And then, but I found it again, kept going, dropped again, 
but I this time I saw it hit the dirt and the dirt splashed. She was out. lucky. She her miss hit a little patch of dirt or something because it's, it's a, a farm field of hay. So usually when you miss, you see nothing, absolutely yeah, there's no nothing. Burns. But she she saw a little, a poof. little poof. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and I saw that was where my crosshair was, and I was like the wind. Died. died. And I think you actually said that on the stage. As she was shooting, she's like, oh, the wind died. Everyone heard it. And, and so I immediately, <laughs> I immediately brought it right in. I didn't bring it perfectly centered because I knew from where I was to yeah. the tree line, right before the targets, there's still a bit of wind. Yeah. So I wanted to hold a little bit for that. But I, I brought it in all the way into the target and I shot as quickly as I could because <laughs> I didn't want the wind to change. And I think I don't have the second highest time, but I was pretty far up there like i i only dropped three three and and she hit she hit the furthest target all three times right yes three, i did one. yeah i remember she was like ding and then bang <laughs> ding bang ding so that was really and then it's my turn to shoot i asked her what the wind is she's like it's not much but then when i was shooting it wasn't it wasn't much, but it was definitely more than her because i started with the one mil i saw the plate rock right so i took some out of it like 0.7 hit hit and as i was walking out Here's another tip. When you're shooting troop lines, be very aware of the difference in distance between your targets because if the distances are huge, your wind call is going to be a lot more drastic from target to target. This was 200 out to 380. So they're fairly significant steps, but they're not massive. It's not like going from an 80-yard target to like a 250-yard target. So since they're a bit closer, I was more or less fine-tuning the wind call in each target. So I would watch the plate rock and then very quickly f send a follow-up shot with a small correction applied to it each time. So I would never send two bullets in the air at the same time, which I could have, because these distances, you can cycle the bullet and pull another one before it impacts. But I made sure I would see the impact. And if I saw the plate rock one way or another, I would apply a slight correction and pull another shot fairly quickly. Um, the, last tar the last two targets I would say are so, um, are so hard to read the plate swing that if you hit it, I would just send it again. <laughs> Unless you see the conditions change, I just held the same for my last six shots on the two targets. Yeah, I also don't shoot with a timer, so I was not aware of how much time I had left, and I, I tend to be a slower shooter. So by the time I got to the last target, as soon as I saw the integrate call off, I just went and <laughs> shot my two shots because yeah. I didn't want a timer. <laughs> yeah, I, have a, I run a timer for my stages. Uh, I often use it, um, but most of the time I don't look at it. However, sometimes it's nice to reference how much time I have left, and I will use it on, on certain stages. I don't think I actually did it on that because I was shooting so fast I knew I wasn't going to run out of time anyway, but mm -hmm. it, is, it is a good tool to have if you know how to train with it. I think, this is off topic again, but I think some shooters have timers, but they are not benef beneficial to their performance because it's another distraction on the stage. They're so focused on looking at their time or trying to like figure out how to time manage stuff that they're forgetting to look at their environmentals. And I've seen people, again, with proper training, it's fine. But once they, when they first get the timer, it's more of a hindrance than anything. So you just have to Would train. Would you say you just train with a timer and not in a match? And then once you've gotten used to it, then you start introducing it into a match? Yeah, that's generally what I would recommend, especially since... As we mentioned before, with like the the ten position stages, you never want to sacrifice a good shot to finish the stage. It's almost always better to make sure you're pulling all good shots and timing out than rushing through a stage and finishing it. So that's that's the reason why I think a lot of these timers that people are running, it takes them a long time to develop their shooting for it to actually be beneficial. Mm -hmm. But it's just another tool that you can train with. So those are the stages we want to cover. Do we want to do the, the last bit or do you want to call it? I know this video is getting long, so. You know what, if, if you're bored of the video, you're probably already gone. <laughs> and if you're bored now, you can leave. So we're just gonna keep going. And All if you right. want to stay, you can stay. So uh, last section we want to talk, touch on is some tips of shooting a two day match because, or a multi-day match, because a lot of people have never done it. And I, um, I know when we first started shooting two-day matches, they felt like a, a marathon. It was hard to stay focused on day two. It's hard physically and mentally. You know, two days, two full days out shooting 
depending on the conditions, like this weekend, it sucked. It was a tough condition to be out in, and two days in a row, mentally you're drained. Actually, I spoke to a lot of shooters on day two in the morning, and a lot of them say, like, I don't even know if I want to shoot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it some was guys. so miserable. <laughs> some guys are like, you know, I don't even know why I'm here. Like, after day one, they've, they've already checked out. Some guys, um, some guys handle it a lot better than others. But again, you know, even disregarding the weather, if you know how to handle a two-day match better than others, it's another advantageous, you know, factor for you. So we have some tips here. Mental preparedness. If you know you're going to shoot a two-day match, you have to prepare for it mentally. <laughs> it's not the same as a one-day because a one-day match, it's just long enough where it doesn't matter what happens, you can get through it. A two-day match, you have to go back to that after sleeping or you know after a night. No matter how well or bad you perform day one. Like. Yeah, you have to lock it in. It, it's funny because you have to teach yourself. You have to take each stage as it comes and each shot as it comes. However, we're humans. We have memory. We know what happened just a few hours ago. <laughs> we know what happened yesterday, but you have to focus on what's happening at the time. Very often after day one, uh, a lot of match directors would post their day one scores and it's up to you if you want to look at them. For some people it's a very bad idea and it would be very appreciated if you don't want to know your friends respect that <laughs> because it does hinder some people's mental games. For me, for example, if I know I'm trying to get to a certain position and I'm nowhere close, I would feel so demoralized for day two that I think I would give up halfway through a stage. <laughs> so yeah, scores, looking at scores midway through a match definitely affect some people. But it's also very important to keep in mind that usually a match like that, not all squads have shot the same stages. So the round count of how many scores were available to each shooter might be different as well. Moreover, if you don't know what another squad has shot, it's really hard to actually compare scores after day one. Usually it's not actually very represent representative of what's going to end up happening at the end of the match. So it's good to keep that in mind. The other thing is, since it's a two-day match, the weather for day one and day two can be very different. We're lucky that it stayed consistent, mm -hmm. but we've been also been to matches where the two conditions were so different that it can flip the the match 180 degrees. Yeah, that's right. So it's up to you if you want to look at scores after the midway point. I would recommend doing it if you know it doesn't affect you. Even if you think it might affect you, just don't look at them because it doesn't really matter. It doesn't. It's not a very good indication of what's happening. And it's almost better not to know most of the time because in a one-day match, you generally don't know the entire field standing halfway through the day. Another thing here is um, day two, especially, is obviously harder on a lot of people. Magneto on especially because a lot of people are camping. Some are RV camping, but some people pitch tents. And they'll stay out, you know, around campfires and stuff and have fun. But if you're... Booze. Yeah, drink a little <laughs> bit. But if you're there um, to try and perform at your highest level, comfort is definitely one thing. If you know you don't sleep well in a tent... Maybe try and find an RV or a hotel. <laughs> also, you don't, if you're very focused on competition, you want to be with a group of people who would take the time to sleep early and mm -hmm. be mentally prepared for day two. Like you can ha goof off and have fun after the match, but during the match, like you don't want to lose focus. Yeah, I think it's a balance of obviously you want to have a good time and then we always have a good time, yeah. but staying focused. Cause if you're there to perform, you want to make sure that that's priority. So you don't want to be a, you know, party pooper and not do anything, but at the same time, you got to make sure you know what works for you and what doesn't leading into day two. So get a lot of rest usually. Well, especially with the weather we got, we were so exhausted after day one anyway. And this sort of leads right into like food. So what do you do? Cause we wanted half decent food not like fast food but we were also miserable cold and tired so we wanted to get back you know shower and get to sleep pretty quickly so we decided to just get uh like sandwiches to eat basically because it's fairly healthy it covers it's all it's filling it covers all the food groups and it's not it's not gonna make you feel like super bloated like a giant steak <laughs> which we've done before <laughs> not the greatest idea so we decided to get sandwiches and, you know, just some drinks and stuff. I think that worked out okay. Yeah, it was good. We, we um, awarded ourselves a little bit of timbits, but... Yes, or as you <laughs> Americans call them, donut holes. Yeah. 
Yeah, we were still a little bit hungry after the sandwiches, so we got some some timbits to eat <laughs> as a filler. But that was fine. I mean, you don't want to make yourself feel groggy on uh, on day two. Next one would be gear maintenance. So again, that's huge because everything, as you know, got soaked. It doesn't matter if you had a, a rain cover for your pack, everything got soaked. So we took the time to, when we got back to the hotel room, we took everything out of our match bags and hung them all over the sofas and everything. Like we used the TV as like a drying rack. <laughs> so what I usually do is I'll put the shooting bags cause they'll get really, really uh, waterlogged. We put them right onto like the, uh, the air conditioner AC. unit or whatever. So the wind is just blowing through them. And then I'll take the time to clean the rifles out and dry them as best as possible because I personally don't like to leave a wet rifle overnight, especially in a case. I would at least air dry it. But since I had my cleaning kit on me, I just cleaned everything as best as I could. So it was as as clean as possible for day two. That's probably a little bit above and beyond what was necessary, but because it was an important match, I took the time to. So quicker dinner so that I could clean the rifles and, and dry out all the gear. And then straight to bed. And then straight to bed. I think we were in bed by 8.30. We also had to get up pretty early, like around five so it worked out and so yeah we went over drying wet clothes and stuff and the, the last one is on a marathon match with 20 stages it's really easy as i mentioned before to let one slip up really get you down it's even worse when it's towards the beginning of this marathon match because if you slip up on your first stage you have 19 stages left you don't want to be in a mindset of oh man you know that sucked you have to think there's still so many points on the table. Don't let one slip up kill you. I mean, if you're having a rough day, you're having a rough day. But then I like to, this goes for any match. I like to sort of flip a switch. If I know I'm performing really poorly, instead of fighting for top spots, I will try and take something out of that match. Always, to learn. Exactly. I will always try and learn or become a better shooter from that match. I know, uh, well, it's not on video because again, uh, towards the beginning of the season, we didn't film a lot of the matches that we were shooting, but I actually had a rough start this season. I don't think it was, uh, it wasn't as public as it wasn't on my, my channel, but the first like four or five matches after our high, uh, you know, off season hiatus, whatever you want to call it, I was uh, struggling. I was struggling to get like within 90% of winner, which I usually can do. And my placement in the leaderboards was uh, reflecting that. So I was quite concerned for you. <laughs> yeah, some time. people some people were like, "Man, like what's up, dude?" <laughs> <laughs> and again, I don't like to judge my performance solely based on where you end up in the leaderboards or, you know, in match placements because I don't think that's a great indication, but I also knew that I wasn't performing at my best. So each match I was taking a lesson out of it, if not more than one lesson, and trying to get better. And then through more practice because we didn't really practice through the winter so when i started dry firing again and shooting more matches getting in the rhythm of it i started performing uh how i wanted to be and then making improvements ab above and beyond what i was last year it's nice because shooting this finale match i can honestly say i'm d i'm definitely a better shooter a pure shooter than i am now than i was last year at magneto one so even though i had a rough start you know it's it's good to uh keep a realistic expectation of what you're doing each match and if you're not fighting for top spots anymore as a as a top shooter you should still be able to enjoy the time and learn something else from the match so that's what i was doing for quite a few matches at the beginning of the season even for people who are not top shooters like myself i was squatted with the top shooters and i if you had a bad stage just know that even the top shooters are not robotics <laughs> yeah. They screw up just as many times as normal person would, and we we've seen some hiccups on many, most, almost all of them. That's really. right. Like at least one stage. Yeah, being squatted with the top shooters is very eye opening because you can realize that we're all human. <laughs> Everyone yeah. has. I mean, someone will shoot the the match of their life sometimes, and it'll look like they're just like, you know, a robot, as you said. But uh, it it's I like the sport because it's all in the small details. It, I've actually, so I've used this, it's not really an analogy, but I've said this before. PRS is actually easy. I, I, like if you break <laughs> down each individual aspect of PRS, each skill set, it's, it's easy. But the difficult part is doing the thousand easy things perfectly consistently for the entire match. That's what makes PRS really difficult. 
Which so, is why the mental game is so important. Which is why the mental game is so, so important. As soon as you have a, ri a good rifle and good dope and good fundamentals, 95% of your performance is going to be mental game. Obviously, there's some things out of your control. Sometimes you get unlucky, but that's what makes sports a sport sometimes. You just have to uh, manage it. You have to manage everything. And there's so many factors, so many small details that add up to putting a little piece of lead on a piece of steel really far away. But that's why we do it, <laughs> because of the small details, right? I think that's it. That's all the points we had you know, to cover. This was obviously a very long-winded video. I don't know how long it is. Let me check my, uh, let me check my thing. So it's going to be, it's probably going to be close to an hour and 15 minutes. I estimate it was good. Yeah. But again, we wanted to do a in-depth coverage of the weekend and give you some tips as well, at least from our perspective, give you, you know, tips of what works for us, do what works for you. Because at the end of the day, if it works for you, then no one can tell you differently. There was one tip I wanted to bring that sure. we never covered. Um, this is when Matt was shooting, I think probably your first year. It was also at Midnight at One, it was a two-day match, and you were focused for 19 stages, and then on the 20th, you saw a friend, and you decided to have a conversation, and you were so <laughs> wrapped up in the conversation, you weren't ready for the stage when it was your turn, but you went up to shoot it anyways, and you dropped all your points there, and he lost the podium. And that was a big lesson learned for both of us, that... <laughs> Like, as much as we love having fun with our friends and we love meeting new people and chatting with people, make sure that by the time you're in the last couple of stages, stay focused. Because that's, e that's the easiest to let it slip is yeah. the last few stages, yeah. So I wasn't trying to be mean at Men and Juan that for refusing the briskets that Adam Cole generously gave us, which is also very delicious. But I was just trying to stay in the mental game, not lose um, all my focus just because I was having a little bit of fun. Um, last year I had a huge tendency of bombing my last two stages because I just couldn't stay focused because I knew it was the finish line and I was just excited. Yeah, every every match Dory would be doing really, really well and then her last one or two stages pff, like straight <laughs> just down. Tanked. So, so I refused to do it this year so that's why I just... Sometimes I would just take myself out of conversations, be in a corner or whatever, just so that I can be in, on the game until the very last stage. Yeah. I'm Again. not trying to be mean. I yeah. just... <laughs> if, you see, if you see a competitor just sort of being on their own, it, it's, it's okay to ask them if they're all right. And, but if they are all right, they probably just want to be left alone because they're in their mental space. So be respectful of that. Oftentimes, if I am sort of like in the zone concentrating. I'll also just take a little, not a walk, but I'll sort of like separate myself with a bit of distance to just get in the zone and then shoot the stage. And then for me, once I get off the stage and there's a little bit of weight lifted off my shoulders when I'm loading my mag and stuff, that's the time to have a chat, eat a snack, you know, uh, have a little bit of fun. But then as you get closer to the next stage, your concentration is, you know, getting locked in again. And it's a repeat after, after every stage. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Thanks for sticking around if you yeah, have. Yeah, if you, if you made it to the end of the video, comment banana. <laughs> <laughs> Just write banana in a comment. Um, I, I, yeah, I have no idea who's going to stick to the end. But I do want to mention, because as you mentioned, with everything going on, especially Dory um, concentrating on her shooting, we're probably not going to be filming many more uh, many more matches this season because all the matches coming up are the regionals and nationals. There's actually Sheepdog next weekend, which we can film. For sure, we're going to film Centerfire. Yeah, so we might, you might see a few more match videos of like my typical match coverage, but if not, we might do more sit-down videos like this. Yeah, well, there's only four matches left to the year, so... That we have planned. So, we'll see what happens. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see Bye. you in the next one. Bye. All right, so again, for this year, we're gonna do, we'll do the, um, uh, the time stage real quick. Uh, someone have that up, by the way. I can't. Yeah. It's not showing my uh, my score, my times for the time stage. Yeah, okay. Only one person cleaned it. One person cleaned it. <laughs> All right. Which was Matt Huey. Matt Huey. Yeah. <laughs> it's like running all the way around. Add that to your pile. Thank of you. Next time. Good. Good.
Good. Thanks. Now stay there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go anywhere. <laughs> All right. So again, we're just gonna we'll have to set you the awards for the for the match. But for top youth, we have. It looks like Peyton Stevens. <laughs> All right, and in top production, we got Dory. Good. All right, and in so third place with 178 out of 212, 211 with uh, Colin Gilmore. I'll send him to you. So majestic. I know. <laughs> All right, in second place with 192, Steve Borsellino. And the person who beat him on the last stage, Matt Huey, with 196. <laughs> No, we were tied going into the last stage, and then I wiped the floor with them. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, we'll get to the top for the season. The top junior is not here. It's Jess Tischler. She's out uh, at the world. So I'll have to go over All right, and top production for the year is Dory. Good. Congratulations. All right, and in third place, it is kind of it. Brett Sharp. And in second place is Steve Borsellino. How's it feel being second? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and top place. What do you think it's you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. Anyways, great shooting guys for the year. It's uh, been a, been a bit of a grind throughout the year, but uh, you know everyone's.